To start, we've got Chris Ray, who's a professor at Stanford in the Stanford AI Lab. Uh, he's been very entrepreneurial, done a lot of open source projects. Some of his projects have become companies. Um, and he works a lot on databases, data structures, machine learning, and is going to tell us about how programming is changing. So. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, yeah. It's really interesting to come to this kind of venue and see sort of topics that you're working on in your lab, but which is such different takes, uh, which is really exciting. I mean, we're doing a lot of stuff in kind of these multimodal and uh, sort of with program synthesis and doing a bunch of stuff in low precision, which also related even to the, the talk on kind of neuro-inspired uh, computing. What I'm going to talk to you about instead, though, is something that uh, is a little bit older work. It's not sort of our latest and greatest, uh, but it's in the last year and a half or so that really changed the arc of our lab. And it's this stuff that, you know, Andre Karpathy has been calling software 2.0. And when we heard him start talking about it, we realized kind of that's what we were thinking. And when we were building the system snorkel over the last two years, uh, you know, software 2.0 is kind of this idea that sort of machine learning is eating more and more of the stack. And sort of traditionally, you think about machine learning as eating kind of, you know, things like translation or uh, traditional kind of uh, sort of robotics things. And indeed, they've been really successful there. I mean, one of the things that really stunned me was this, you know, thing where they said Google shrinking its language translation from 500,000 lines of code to 500 lines of code. And you know, kind of everyone has kind of this same translation infrastructure. People may fight about the details, but this thing that was kind of a beast that was relegated to you know, only the tech giants, all of a sudden kind of became a commodity almost overnight. And one of the things that's really exciting to me is that it's not just these you know, bespoke machine learning based, AI based products, but there's all kinds of things in sort of ETL, you know, extract, transform, load, data cleaning, tuning software, networking, that are moving from kind of a bunch of heuristics to ML first. And so that transition, I think, is really interesting for a lot of what's going on inside computing. Right? So if you haven't followed this, you know, sort of the input to the 1.0 stack, if you like, was the way you would encode your knowledge about the world was in low-level code, like C code or something like this. And it would be compiled down to machine instructions. One of the things that's really exciting on the other side of this, uh, this 2.0 stack is that the way you program, by and large, is creating training sets, performing data augmentations. You encode your knowledge about the world, maybe a little bit obliquely, by, by what you choose to show the machine learning algorithm. Okay? Now, the other part, which I won't get a lot of uh, time to talk about, is that also the lower level abstraction is changing. Instead of compiling down to you know, an ISA and x86, you're actually starting to see people swap models. And there's a sort of a, a set of commodity models that people are able to now build specialized hardware for. And so you're seeing a lot of innovation actually coming in computing from the bottom up as hardware races to meet this new abstraction for these really high dollar value problems. So why is this happening? I think you, know, you have folks who are you know, different stripes of uh, AI and machine learning researchers, and they view it, what's going on, th through sort of different lenses. To me, as a person who really likes to build software products, there's sort of two software engineering reasons why these deep learning systems are taking over, and it's not necessarily because they have the best quality on any given task. The first reason is that it's a lot easier to build these products sort of quickly with teams that don't have to focus their entire lives on building a translation engine that they can build them and sort of download something that's a commodity and get a pretty good working product. And so the margin of building a better model is, is kind of going away. The second bit is if you've ever tried to deploy machine learning software in practice, you know that the features in the sort of old hand-tuned code that you would have would not survive very many generations of engineers. The person who built the first version of the model would leave, then you're kind of out of luck. You didn't know why the features worked. And so you were in this constant rebuilding cycle. Instead, sort of the low-level details have been abstracted away. There's also this aspect which I didn't really appreciate until uh, you know, maybe about a year and a half ago uh, when Kunle really started getting in my ear about this. So that's Kunle el -Kutin. He's the uh, for, sort of father of multi-core and a Stanford professor. And what he really got on me about was the fact that deploy is now much, much easier when you have these neural net models. When you have a big company and you want to ship software, you have to make sure that it doesn't blow up memory, that it consumes predictable resources. And one of the things that was great inside Andre's post is he talked about how at Tesla, if you want to reduce the resources that a CNN, say, is using, kind of just cut it in half. This is something you really can't do with conventional software to right-size it for sort of data center usage. Moreover, the runtimes are really regular because it sort of forces you, by the way the programming model works, to get rid of nasty things like allocations that computer science hasn't been able to really deal with. So in another life, uh, I do kind of math programming stuff. I'm actually going to go to ISMP next week and talk about how to optimize uh, sort of you know, machine uh, sort of learning algorithms at a very low level for hardware. Uh, but I won't talk about it here, but this is really, really critical. So really, I want to focus on the sort of software engineering side of why these things are so exciting. And there's a company called Samba Nova Systems, uh, co-founded based on some tech that came out of our lab uh, that's, that's now spun up making some of this hardware. 
So to put you in sort of the frame of mind that we were coming at this problem back, about two years ago, we made this sort of following bet. We were looking at all the deep learning research that was going on. We were tremendously excited that problems we had worked on uh, for a long while were all of a sudden getting solved. But we kind of thought that they would basically become commodities. And what we were seeing is kind of this asymptote. You heard you know, earlier talks make reference to this as well, that sort of it was kind of clear that there wasn't a huge amount of margin in sort of new architectures. Lots of people excited and working on it, but we started to take kind of at the time the outsider's bet that basically it was going to become a commodity. And that was going to become its real value. That folks who were not deep learning researchers could download TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, and build something awesome. And so we started looking at this idea in a NIPS paper in 2016, and we called it data programming. That was a terrible name, uh, but we thought it was awesome. It was like, you know, you program by training sets. Then Andre came by and he said, hey, what about software 2.0? We're like, that's a way better name. And so we adopted that pretty, pretty quickly after that. You should never let me name things if you know the history of me naming projects. In any case, but the core idea was a simple one. The idea was if you looked at what actual engineers were doing, if you went to even big companies, they weren't spending their time building models. They were spending their time on training data. They're spending time shaping their training data. And as kind of a theoretically minded person, I thought it was really strange that if you looked at what theory was obsessed with, it was not where they spent their time. The theory was obsessed with convergence guarantees and generalization bounds and all kinds of things, which is exciting, and you know, we've worked on them as well. But really, all the time that an engineer was spending was kind of this wild and woolly thing that didn't have any mathematical structure. And so we thought, you know, can we do something about this? And of course, the progress will be modest. And I want to show you at least one technical uh, uh, problem where you can make a little bit of progress. But that's what we've been about, is trying to figure out all these things are outside in the model. How do we bring them into the sort of statistical fold and start to do a little bit of theory about them? Okay. So maybe at this point, this sounds crazy. Like if you're a traditional machine learning person, the way that your problem sets up is that x and y's come. They descend from God herself. They show up. You don't know how the x and y's got there, but then you have to work with them. But this is clearly ludicrous, right? We want to model how these y's come about, and we want to figure out what about those y's can help us build machine learning products faster, better, and with sort of fewer errors. So one key idea that we came up with in this was this idea that you know, if training data is the entire way to uh, program, what makes a good or a bad training set? And one of the things we realized is that since these training sets are all sort of created by a process, many different systems interleaving to be able to build a training set, what if we could model those sources of data? Would that allow us to do things like leverage vastly different qualities of training data? And this was in response to watching folks actually struggle when they would take high quality and low quality data and mix it together in their training sets and get kind of unpredictable results. And so as I'll show you, I want to show you one little example where modeling this process allows you to build some models dramatically more efficiently. Okay? Now, as, I me as was mentioned earlier, I'm from Stanford. Uh, I've soaked up about as much Silicon Valley as one human can. Uh, so you may think this is some kind of reality distortion bubble. I honestly don't care. I have pink shorts on with little with a cross bows or whatever on them. I clearly don't care about reality. Okay? <laughs> so, I want to show you one problem, though, where you can make progress. And this is this label paucity problem, which sounds like a fancy thing, but I just mean you don't have enough labels for your task. This was inspired because we would work with folks in cancer research and other places. And they'd say, I want to get a great image recognition algorithm, but I don't have any labels. What do I do? And you know, we we're like, I don't know, label some data. And they're like, no, we, we can't do that. It's really, really expensive. We'll spend years on it. So we started building this snorkel thing. Okay. Just a, it's an art project. Uh, it's a prototype. You can go and look at it online and see sort of the art that we're trying to do there. And I'll explain to you why we're building this. Okay. So the folks that did the real work, two of them are now faculty at Brown and Cornell, respectively. Henry joined Facebook. Alex is on the market uh, next year. And Paroma is also outstanding, and she will be on the market the year after. I'm, I'm, not I'm not at all have any shame about plugging my students. All right. So what happened, we all know this as sort of deep learning folks. Deep learning is becoming kind of a commodity. The success or failure of an application doesn't depend on the model necessarily. It depends on the training sets that you feed it to a first approximation. Of course, models matter. Right? One of the things that highlighted this for us was conversations with Feifei when she was talking a lot about ImageNet and the successor visual genome of trying to create these large training sets and watching graduate students, you know, very smart people, suffer in some cases for person years to be able to build these training sets to advance the state of the art in computer vision. So we saw this thing that creating training sets is often the bottleneck, and we set about trying to solve it. Okay? Now, the other bit that I sometimes have to validate is people get offended by uh, is when I say deep learning is a commodity. This is a slide that I stole from Chris uh, Manning, you know, sort of an NLP god from our second floor. 
Uh, and he had this one slide last year in a keynote. To a first approximation, the consensus in NLP is that no matter what the task, you throw a bias TM at it with attention if you need information flow. Now that sounds to me a lot like a commodity. When even NLP researchers are like, well, we just download one model, we set two flags, we make it a BIDAF, and we're done. So this to me suggested that this commoditization is really actually taking hold, even in, in for researchers, not just for production engineers, which is pretty cool. Now, this is just a trolling slide. Uh, I don't know what the old new oil was, but the new new oil is clearly training data. Uh, and this is a fundamental problem in machine learning. Okay? Now, the key idea is, as I said, the training data doesn't come from God herself. It shows up because of a process. Some engineer wrote some kind of script to be able to generate all those different pieces of training data. And we just want to see with the dumbest model of that process, can we do a little bit better? Okay? So that's what, data, that's what snorkel, started Snorkel, uh, was that modeling the training set creation process. So how does this work? Okay. Well, the first idea is that you're going to have about as simple as a pipeline as possible. You're going to write these things called labeling functions. This is just a map for those of you who are familiar with this. It's a function that's going to take a point and for the simplicity, just say yes, no, or I don't know. Okay. You can do fancier stuff than that. And then domain experts are going to code up their knowledge with those little sloppy things. It could look up as we see in a dictionary. It can you know, run a program. It can do whatever it wants. What the system sees is basically those labels, but it knows importantly where those labels come from. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna learn a generative model of those uh, accuracies. It's gonna know that those labeling functions have different accuracies and they may be correlated. For experts, what's going on here is we're going to try and learn the parameters of this generative model, provably without seeing any training data, okay? without any hand-labeled data. And the reason we're gonna be able to do this is because we're gonna look at where they conflict and where they agree, and we're gonna basically try and get the weakest statistical assumptions we can that allow us to prove that we can recover those parameters. And that's kind of the theory that we've been marching on for the last year and a half or so. Once you do that, you're going to take that and you're going to feed it to a discriminative model. Why don't we just use the generative model? Because it's kind of impoverished and it doesn't let us leverage all the good stuff that's gone on in deep learning. So we want to be able to build this training set, as I talked about, and then get all the nice sort of generalization benefits of embeddings and LSTMs and everything else. So intuitively what's going to happen is we're going to have a generative model that has high precision, and then if we're doing a text problem, we'll generalize and get high recall. Now we've also done this in imaging and knowledge-based completion and a bunch of tasks, and I encourage you to look through those to see exactly where the gains are coming from. Uh, and we're working on a theory of exactly why that happens. Okay. Importantly, there's no hand-labeled data. Now, of course, if you have hand-labeled data, you should use it. This is an art project. I'm a professor. Like, I think it's interesting not to have any hand-labeled data, data to try and hold our feet to the fire that we're doing something new and interesting. But if you have it, there's nothing that prevents you from putting it in there and saying this is perfectly accurate data. So how does it work operationally? Let me just give you one example to show how this thing works. So what they do, what's going to happen is the user's going to load in some unlabeled data. They're going to write these things called labeling functions. I'll illustrate a simple one in NLP in the next slide. And they're going to choose a standard discriminative model, okay? that by LSTM maybe that Chris mentioned earlier. What's going to happen underneath the covers is Snorkel's going to apply that to the entire data set. It's going to learn a model of the noise. It's going to assume that those labeling functions are inaccurate and potentially correlated. Then it's going to figure out and pass those, that uncertainty onto the discriminative model, which is really simple to do if you know the formulation. You can do it with any discriminative model. And importantly, as I mentioned, no hand-labeled data sets. So let's see an example. So if you've ever built a distance supervision app, this is like a classical technique from natural language processing, you have a database, you want to fill out the database. Here I have chemicals and diseases. Okay? I want to fill out you know, which chemicals cause which disease. Very, very simplified view of this task. And let's say that I have a database that contains some of those A-B pairs. What I'm going to do through a very simple heuristic is anytime I see a chemical A and a disease B that also occur in my database, I'm going to label the entire sentence as true. Okay? This is my classification task. Okay? Now, this is likely to be true, actually. This is something like you know, the Jurafsky and Mintz paper is great about explaining exactly when this works for various knowledge-based completion tasks. But of course, it can also be false. right? Chemical A was found on the floor with a person with disease B. Doesn't indicate any kind of relationship we care about, but we're still, because of the way the function works, going to label it. And we're going to tolerate that noise. Now, if this is your only source of supervision, all you have to do is basically regularize. You fit some hyperparameter, you say it's noisy, and you can kind of deal with it. But what happens if you have multiple such sources? That's where the things get a little bit fun. And what we're going to do is we're going to figure out when there are multiple such sources, we're going to be able to estimate their accuracies, assuming there are these other rules, without having to see any training data. Okay. Now, if you looked at that and said, well, there's nothing in your example that assumed anything about distance supervision, uh, you'd be exactly right. There isn't. 
Uh, you could put in crowdsourcing, weak classifiers, domain heuristics, and rules. What we're trying to do, as I explained earlier, is take all that process that people use before training the model and those X and Y pairs come into being and just figure out a way to package it and reason about it. So we want a simple and stupid model. Now, it turns out for technical reasons, you can also have dependencies. And in fact, we can provably learn them. And some much better theory about how to learn them with the right scaling will come out this summer. Uh, but we had an ICML paper about how to learn those dependencies. You can learn various features or conditions under which uh, the functions have accuracies. Let's say your one function works well on web pages, but not on Word documents. You can learn some of that stuff provably. And also, as talked about earlier, this multiple task setting is something that we've seen a lot of our users go nuts for, where they have a bunch of labels for one domain, and they want to transfer that knowledge to another. A bunch of low-level NLP labels, and they want to do some extraction task. And they love to be able to benefit from both. We want to be able to incorporate all of that kind of information. So a couple of little tidbits. One thing that was surprising to us is that we, as I'll show you, ran some workshops on this. And with everything as supervision, uh, it turned out that people could basically just run models in a much more lightweight way. It was a lot like them using kind of a Python-like framework versus a C framework. They would throw in some supervision, run a model, and get something out. Even if it was imperfect, they kind of knew where to start. And so that was really helpful for non-experts. Uh, it also turned out, as I mentioned, people would write these high precision rules, and we would generalize them. But perhaps most interesting is this last point here, which is that people started to use supervision as code, which is something that is really weird to me. But they would take and write their supervision. They would then you know, have one task. And they would transfer the code, not the labels, to the next task. And they would see sometimes that by transferring that code, they would get great results and be able to have this interesting way of interacting with software, which we didn't quite expect when we started this. Okay. So what's this new challenge? I want to illustrate to you why this is such a challenge of dealing with training data of an even quality and why you need to model it. And it's a really, this is actually a real example with a, with a person uh, who did this. And we had this really frustrating experience. So uh, in time in memoriam, we built a system that basically at its core was doing a lot of weak supervision, a system called Deep Dive, which was later commercialized as Lattice. And we would give it to folks and tell them how to build basically these distant supervision pipelines. And one user basically, to a first approximation, did the following. And it was a pretty common pattern. They wrote several of what we would now call labeling functions, these high precision but low coverage distance supervision rules. And for the sake of argument, let's say that they labeled 10,000 points at 90% accuracy. Okay. They trained their model. Life was good. They kind of went about their way. But then they would introduce something to try and get more coverage. And in this case, they introduced you know, a single low precision but high coverage rule. And it labeled, let's say, a million points at 60%. Now, if you don't model that these points come from different places, something very disturbing happens. And the very disturbing thing is that you basically have approximately a million points at about 60 point something accuracy, because it's an undifferentiated mass. Now, the fix is really simple. You just have to track which points were labeled by which functions. Then you could learn, potentially, those different accuracies and kind of resolve this problem. Instead, what would happen is that the user would put in more data, and their model quality would go down, and they would have no idea what to do next. And so as a software engineering thing, being able to actually kind of have that like monotonic experience where it feels like it's getting better the more information you give it was pretty important to us. So how does it work? I'm not going to go into uh, all the different you know, nitty gritty, but I encourage you to look at the papers or come find me later. Basically, what's going to happen is we're going to learn this generative model at, up front. Uh, we're going to learn and infer then how noisy each point is, and then pass this to the LSTM. And there's recipes on how to do this for basically every model. The game that we're playing, theoretically, is we're trying to understand the weakest possible statistical conditions when we can provably learn that first part. And that's what we've been after for the last year and a half or so. We've also been producing software to try and figure out what failure modes actually occur in the wild so that people would give us feedback about whether this was easy to program with or not, and which of those errors, when people build training sets, we can actually debug. And that's a big thrust of our group is to try and understand that. To that end, we actually, last summer, this project's only like a year and a half, two years old. This guy, Jason Fries, did a really cool thing. Uh, he basically invited a bunch of folks out who were uh, biologists and medical practitioners and had a one-day workshop and said, you know, you can either get access to seven hours of Mechanical Turk or you can get, take our seven-hour workshop and let's see what your accuracy looks like between these two extremes. Now, the amazing thing is that there were 15 people who started in the workshop. 14 of them finished and got a good model. The other one was a professor. Let this be a lesson to you to never include faculty in your user studies. <laughs> right? 
The cool thing that happened here, which was amazing, is that everyone who did finish got a pretty good model. This chart's way too complicated, but the things I want you to take away are that basically people got higher quality using this in, a, in an individual session. And so we've been trying to get more rigorous data about this. There's no published paper, but we've been running these workshops periodically to try and see, hey, can we actually get people to build some class of models really rapidly? Now, there are a bunch of current users, and there's a bunch of larger company users whose logos will appear on this slide relatively soon. Uh, it's only two years old, but it kind of speaks to the pain point that people are putting this in production. And I'll, I'll show you one or two of the production examples in, a, in the next second. Okay? One thing that I always do when I give these talks, uh, we are building kind of a, a library of all the folks. When I was in CVPR last week, I pitched this to. If you have interesting papers that you think are related in weak supervision, send them to us. We want to consolidate this. People have worked on this in a host of different fields. We come out of kind of, as I said, this math programming MLPs. CVPR had a bunch of interesting stuff for us. The NLP community has a bunch of interesting stuff. Send us more information. We're maintaining a blog post about it and running a workshop at NIMS. Okay. So please, send feedback. We're really happy to receive it. The last bit, I just want to hit a couple of highlights. And I'm unfortunately going to go through these talks really quickly and not do the work justice. Paroma basically said her thesis about working with the Vision Lab and saying, weak supervision is not just for text. You may think, and we did too, how do you write those labeling functions in a way that you know, really transfers? And the main idea, and this is actually something we've, we've been doing, is that sort of the vocabulary that comes underneath, the, underneath these images are object detectors, things that you can recognize, textures. And you can basically write and actually synthesize, using program synthesis, entire programs that basically label these images with either a small amount of label data for synthesis or no label data whatsoever. So she's done a bunch of work. There was some stuff in MIPS last year about this. Uh, the thing that's really, really amazing is that the trick that she had to pull was to actually analyze this, the way that people were writing the software, basically the software tree, the, the AST tree, to be able to figure out where there were potential lurking correlations. And at least on one real example, uh, which you should take with a real grain of salt, she could show by doing this kind of static analysis technique that she could actually beat some fully supervised baselines, and people were actually starting to use this. And a paper will come out with the Vision Lab where we held our feet to the fire even more and showed that we could actually, uh, in fact, double the number of tuples that were extracted for something called visual genome. Okay? So this is super cool. But it's not just noisy labels. Another thing I want to do, Ginger's going to start at CMU next year. You should follow her. She's, a, she's going to be an absolute superstar professor. Um, but we've been looking at beyond this as well. Uh, there was a paper called Tanda that uh, was recently improved quite dramatically by the Google folks. Basically, what it was doing is learning to compose trans uh, transformations. So one technique you do on images is that you start to do augmentations. And we sort of looked at learning sequences of augmentations automatically that would improve image performance. The, the auto augment stuff is much better than what we were doing. It basically allows you to get new state of the art on a bunch of tasks. We were just showing that it, it can avoid kind of catastrophic problems and compete with hand labeled data. We're also doing a bunch of theory, which I won't waste your time with, about augmentation. The last bit I wanted to mention is that this idea that old tasks are becoming ML first. And keep in mind, this project's only been running for two years, but people are starting to use it all over the place. Uh, so actually, it's starting to get used by you know, DARPA and you know, uh, different district attorneys for investigating human trafficking. Uh, it's used by a bunch of IoT folks, uh, Stanford Medicine, and also Alibaba to basically do things like extract information from part sheets. Or more nicely, there's this application that Alibaba built and put into production where they're basically looking at ads for cars and then making structured search out of them. Okay? So my point is, like, this stuff is actually starting to get used by folks and kind of fills a weird, unique pain point where folks are saying, hey, we just want to take the kind of commodity model that's out there, do multitask supervision, and very, very quickly feed it and iterate on top of it. Uh, let's get rid of this. Okay? It's also been used in some data cleaning. Uh, this guy is the, the uh, CTO of a company called Tamer. Uh, so he knows what he's talking about in data cleaning. And then together, uh, Theo and Shu wrote this paper uh, last year that basically showed with weak supervision, you can actually do an incredible job uh, even on commodity data cleaning tasks, which was all their work and was, was really exciting. Okay? You can download it now. I should plug them. So with that, oop, I think my conclusion slide was eaten. So with that, I will conclude. <laughs> and I just want to emphasize three key things. The first thing that I wanted to tell you and why I put this laundry list of examples at the end is that programming, I think, is changing in a pretty profound way, in a different way than I've seen in my career in computer science. Basically, you're having this thing where the abstraction is coming up. It's going away from ISAs. So all these hardware companies are rushing in. Super exciting, because hardware looked like it was dead k years ago. Now it's a really exciting space to be in. And there's a lot of uh, opportunity there, which is exciting. 
On the top side, machine learning has always held this promise that it would allow you to very sort of imprecisely specify software and build it rapidly. Uh, and now that seems to be coming true in a number of different domains. It's really interesting to think about where that paradigm breaks down. But the software 2.0 paradigm seems to actually eat a fair amount of a commodity software stack in a pretty interesting way. And the last thing I wanted to mention is definitely check out the Snorkel blog and send a bunch of feedback. Uh, if there are things you think we should look at or we are totally wrong about something, uh, we have thick skin. Go ahead and send it to us. Thanks so much for your time and attention. Simon from uh, GraphCore. Uh, so obviously, I believe uh, hardware is exciting. Thank you yeah. for <laughs> confirming that. It's <laughs> a shocking claim. Coming and from. Uh, <laughs> it's it's now no news to anyone that people are building hardware to accelerate the learning bit. Right. Um, do you think there's a case for building hardware to accelerate the generation or preparation of data? Yeah, I think it's interesting as you try, started to see one of the things, you know, especially with the Samba Nova side of the world, is more on the converged solution side. So there's definitely learning. There's inference, which is, of course, by itself a big market. Learning, which is a great market. But as you start to see these pipelines become more complex and start to go beyond just sort of the traditional backprop, but actually start to involve deeper amounts of data augmentation, deeper amounts of looking for side supervision, and deeper amounts or more interesting kinds of pipelines for learning, I think it's definitely the case that you're going to start to see sort of acceleration of things that look like sparse ops and other things like that coming into the pipeline. So it's going to be really interesting to figure out what the form factor is. One of the things that's most exciting to me is you know, the market is large enough that sort of a 1,000 flowers will bloom in this market in different ways. There are some folks who are going to really you know, nail and focus on uh, you know, just the learning piece and really be the accelerator there and get TCO. There's a bunch of folks who say, you know, uh, inference is the big TCO thing that's driving a lot of the, you know, fearsome five. We're going to sell them a bunch of chips. And then there's sort of the converged solutions of like end-to-end -end pipelines. And so you're seeing, you know, how this market sorts out is pretty interesting. Uh, it's huge, though, as you well know. Uh, the TAM is kind of off the charts. So I think you're going to see not just one solution or two solutions. What's going to make hardware really exciting is that it will be nice if there's, you know, K solutions for some exciting value of K, not just like one and, you know, one prime and things like that or how it's been so far. Great, great question, though. Other questions, comments? Oh. Hi, uh, this is Robin from Similar.ai. Uh, so we build product understanding using some weekly supervised and also strongly awesome. supervised approaches, uh, often from text, unstructured text and images. Do you see, um, can you think of any weekly supervised examples of uh, multimodal learning, building embedded spaces between text and and vision as an example. Yeah, that's an awesome one. So the you know one of the, the projects that's most exciting and where we get the largest gains in quality right now is actually with the radiologists, uh, where you actually have medical reports and you have a bunch of images. We also have another application which is running with the VA, with the Veterans Affairs. This is like the you know hospital basically service for all the military in the U.S. Uh, running where we're doing kind of device surveillance on unlimited data where you're starting to see you know, medical reports and a bunch of images and hopefully a bunch of sensing data in the future. And what we've noticed is whenever we do those combinations, when they're really those complementary signals, that's when you get the biggest boosts from them, as I think you've probably seen as, as well. When you're focused on you know, text and sort of the way that people have done multi-class learning or multitask learning for the last couple of years, when it's been something like parse the sentence and do co-reference, I mean, we were doing that 10 years ago, and it kind of gets you limited gains. When you start to look at various different sources across, that's when you get the big F1 bumps that look like 10 points, 15 points. Um, and so the multimodal area is one that we're really excited about. My postdoc's probably killing me for making reference to those numbers because they're still under review. But um, th that's the kind of that direction is one that we find the most exciting, and definitely would love to hear uh, you know feedback, similar stories, or more interestingly, where it didn't work um, if you've seen those kind of experiences. But that seems like a massive opportunity. Uh, Martin from Filament AI. Um, I think, in my intuition, most of the examples of, of the weak programs that you provided uh, were actually regular expressions. Like, you just imagine how many regular expressions are getting written every day in the world right. to, like, you know, uh, detect certain patterns. And um, I've seen a bunch of research about trying to figure out from different examples of regular expressions 
about how to do things, but they don't actually use neural networks. Is there any connection to regular expressions specifically, like auto automata in great, general? Great, great, great question. Uh, unexpectedly, uh, yes is the, the thing that I would say here. So one bit is I sort of picked these text examples because we spent a couple of years winning text competitions, and that's the place where it's sort of most grounded. Most of the interesting weak supervision is actually is not regular expression. It is this image-based where you have different sort of uh, libraries that you're calling, that seems to be the direction that it's going. But back to your core point about understanding the connections between automata and deep learning, great papers that have come out, uh, the Technion folks in particular, of trying to back out from an RNN, a Yoav Goldberg's group and others, like what the automata is that's underneath the covers. And then in antiquity, I ran, won a couple of uh, weird theory awards for actually figuring out complexity classes that involve automata for these kinds of extractor programs. And so I think I'm now worried that a lot of our examples are biased by like my you know shameful PhD youth uh, writing a regular expressions for everything. Um, so I don't mean to I don't mean to give you that impression. It is true though that one of the things that is exciting is to take those programs that already exist. Like the thing that I think may make machine learning to your core point really exciting is when you don't have to cross a big bridge to learn it. You know, there's been a lot of progress from folks like the Keras folks and PyTorch and TensorFlow of making deep learning really accessible, but there's still, as was illustrated earlier in, in some of the talks, like an existing software workflow. If you can get into that and take the data and exhaust, I love that phrase, exhaust, of what people are already doing, regular expressions, log data, even where they're looking on the screen, and turn that into better machine learning models, that seems like a, seems like a huge lift. Great, great point.